I was a youth pastor for a very long time, and during being a youth pastor, you learn to do a whole bunch of stuff with high school and college age kids, and they always want to do stuff that's extreme, like we go whitewater rafting and rock climbing and all that kind of stuff. But when I was in South Texas, the favorite thing that everybody wanted to do, all the kids always wanted to go play paintball. Now, I don't want to brag, but I became kind of an expert at paintball. And I don't know why you're laughing, sir. Okay. So I became really, really good. So we bring all these kids out there where they would play, and there was this smaller paintball field and a huge paintball field at the place that we would play. And so we would go out there, and we would divide up. And I mean, listen, I, it was I, compared to a bunch of middle schoolers playing paintball, I was a skilled tactician. And so like I would go out there and annihilate children. It was really, really fun. It's how you show love. Shoot them in the head. And so like, like I'm just like, just like you know, paintball blasting these kids all the time. It was so much fun. And then one day we're out there and we're shooting everybody up and this guy comes over who runs the paintball thing. He goes, hey Jason, um, do you guys want to all play together on one team over on the big field? We have another team that would love to play against you guys. Uh, and I was like, yeah, who are these suckers that you're rolling out in front of us? Because we're elite paintball professionals. <laughs> or so we thought. And then he took us over there, and we immediately knew this was not going to go the way we had hoped. Because we rented our equipment, and they owned theirs. We were in gym shorts and hoodies. They were in, like, camo. It was obvious that this was about to go really bad, really fast. And so we go out there to play paintball, and let me tell you what happened. This, it was no exaggeration, we're on this huge field, we're forever apart, um, and uh, like 30 seconds into this, 18 out of 20 of my players are off the field. And everyone that's leaving, we're like, did you get anybody? And they're like, no. And they're all walking off with like paint right here. Like, it's, like it's serious paintball warfare that's going on out here. And the only two guys left were me and a guy named Tyler Hanks. And we were behind this barricade, and Tyler was crying. I'm like, come on, Tyler. And Tyler's like, what are we going to do? And I looked at him, and I said this. Give me your gun. <laughs> He threw his gun to me, and then he goes, now what? And I said, run. <laughs> and he headed off in the opposite direction. And I took two paintball guns in my hands. And I leaned up against the barricade. And then I came out like a movie. And I was, I mean, I, in my mind, this was going to be the most brilliant plan. And I turned around, and I was just like, and then 1,800 paintballs hit me at the same time. It was just like, I got lit up. It was terrible. I had little bruises all over my body. It was painful. And we realized something. One of those two teams came out to play a game. And the other team came out like paintball is life. And there was a dramatic difference between the two. And the reason we're in this spiritual warfare series is because, to be honest, so many of us approach spiritual warfare the same way. We mostly approach it as if it's something that we teach to our kids, and we use it as this neat little metaphor for something for children. And we kind of treat it like a game. But we have an adversary that is not playing. He is on a real attack, and he is playing for keeps. And there is an eternal significance to this battle. And so we have to amp up how we take this thing. Otherwise, we're at risk of having a tremendous defeat and having not only us but others wounded in the battle simply because we didn't take it seriously enough. So in, until we reach a moment as a church where we can ag agree that this is a real battle that we're in, we cannot begin to take ground. Not only that, we can't dilute the truth of this. This may not be the most comforting passage of Scripture. To remind us that we're in a battle isn't the most relaxing thing about the Christian faith. And yet we don't want to dilute anything down. In 2002, there was a guy in Kansas City, a pharmacist. I don't know if you guys remember this story. But a pharmacist that got arrested for diluting medication. 4,000 patients were impacted by him. Uh, not only that, but they had 13 cancer patients that died because they received diluted forms of chemotherapy. Until this guy was arrested, he actually raked in over $19 million for holding back all these medications. 
And I think sometimes in the church we're guilty of the same thing. When, when it becomes uncomfortable, when it becomes challenging, we tend to dilute things down and make it easier and more palatable. And we cannot afford to do that here. And so we are trying to aggressively address the armor of God and what it looks like in our life on a daily basis. And today in Ephesians chapter 6, we're looking at two elements. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what Ephesians 6, 17 tells us. Now, if you don't know anything about the city of Ephesus, this place where this was written to, it was wealthy, it was intellectual, and it was a very spiritual place. They weren't focused on Jesus, but they were incredibly spiritual. They, and and their, their spiritual life was really based on fear. Every time they were afraid of something, they went out and looked for a God that they could try to appease. We got the, oh, the tinkle train. Look at there. That's awesome. <laughs> That is the largest group of kids going to the bathroom I have ever seen from our kids. Look at that. It's like it's contagious. <laughs> All right, sorry. Let me get back. Where was that talking? All right, so, um, so what happened in there is they would tend to get so into the fears that they had, they would find gods that they could appeal to, and they would appeal to these gods in order to... Um, to kind of calm their fears. And you'd say that kind of sounds silly, but we see that today in our culture all the time. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been scrolling Facebook when you see some article with some title that you're like, oh man, i got to read that. Like sometimes it gives us paranoia. Matter of fact, I found one. It's called clickbait. It's stuff they designed just to get your attention. Oh, I have one that looks like this. The outrageous truth about green gummy bears will destroy your world. Now, if you see that, you go, oh man, i got to read that article. Like, what's in there? Is some sort of poison? How's it gonna, is it going to kill us? What's happening with green gummy bears? I read the article. Let me tell you the earth-shattering truth that this article revealed. It says the company that makes these, Hasbro, that has made them for years and years and years and years and years, doesn't put lemon-lime flavoring into the green, which is what we associate it with. It's strawberry. That's it! That's the earth-shattering world-shaking truth. But we live in such a culture that everything is about instilling fear. It's like if you watch the news, at the end of every news segment, they constantly go to something that makes you stay through the commercial, right? Like you can't turn it off. You're like, all right, I saw the news show that I wanted to see. And then at the end, they're like, hey, but you, do you know what's in your soup? And you're like, what? And, and then, then all of a sudden, you got to watch it. Like, it's a commercial for Pop-Tarts and Toyota. And I'm like, man, I really hope they tell me what's in my soup because I thought it was broth, but I don't know. It could be wrong. And it comes back on, and I'm like, but you, it's broth. And you're like, knew it. I got it. I knew that one. And I told you guys. And then they're like, but you, do you know what's in your broth? And you're like, oh, man. And like, like it just keeps going, and it, it just freaks you out over and over again to instill fear. Before any of you, by the way, start Googling it, it's just broth, okay? Like, I just want to give you guys some peace. So we have this thing that presses this fear in us. And when we feel fear, cultural fear, then what happens is one of two responses come. We either try to attack people, or we run and hide from the situation. And what Paul is going to tell us in Ephesians 6 is that there's a third option. Instead of attacking people and instead of hiding from the situation, that the third option is to consider that the battle you're facing is actually a spiritual battle. And so it requires a spiritual solution. And that's what we want to focus on as we look at these last two elements of the armor of God. We're going to look at, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, how to protect our mind and how to weaponize the word of God. So we want, to, we want to make sure that we put on the helmet of salvation. Why, why a helmet? I'll tell you why I think it is. We get salvation in. The Bible says that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we get Jesus Christ in our mind. It moves into our heart. It comes out in our actions and behaviors and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and we have to put a shield kind of around that brain. Because if we're not careful, what happens to me probably happens to you. Is this is the, the battlefield that Satan tends to go after. And so we need it to be guarded. And, and here's why we need it to be guarded. Because Satan wants to get in your head. As a matter of fact, if you're taking notes to write this down, he wants to steal our focus. So what is our focus? It's really important if he wants to steal it that we understand what it is. Well, then look at that. We're going to go all the way back to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to look at this verse. It says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He said, you were dead. In your transgressions and sins. You're not asleep. You're totally and completely unresponsive. 
It's a long story, but I had to help a coroner one time um, in a very small town that I lived in, and there was a body there that we were uh, dealing with, and um, I was kind of freaked out already, and he lifted the body, kind of raised it up, and I, I was holding it for him, and he said, I'm sorry, I left something out of the room. I've got to go get it, and I'll be right back. And so he <laughs> left me alone in a room, just me and a body. And after a while, my arm was starting to get tired. Like it was, the, and it was really, I thought, inconsiderate of the guy that I was holding. Is he didn't help at all? <laughs> but do you know why? Because dead people are unresponsive. That's what he's telling us about your sin. You weren't kind of bad. You were dead. God's love landed, and you were initially unaffected by it. But he goes on to say this, and this is what's so great about God in the gospel. It says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us what? Alive. With Christ, even though we were what? Dead. Dead in our transgressions. For it is by... Now, Oscar and I are not the only ones playing along here. You guys get on with us. Here we go. Um, even though we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. So here's the deal. You, if you are in Christ, you have been resurrected from the dead. Nobody excited about that. Not one person. Okay, I got you. Listen. If you are in Christ, you have been resurrected from the dead. But you didn't resurrect you. You had nothing to do with it. God did that. And God didn't wait for you to feel guilty about it to move towards you. He didn't wait for you to acknowledge you had messed up. He moved towards you while you were messed up. And that's what grace is. It's the wildest thing about God's love. Even though he knew millions of people would reject him, God did it anyway. That's what's so awesome about him. A lot of times people, when they come into Christ or they come into the, even the church, they get into this weird mind of, I've somehow got to get cleaned up and get good in order to go. I, I asked my wife to join me at the gym, and my wife, had, and I don't know if any of you guys have this thing that goes on, uh, but my wife will constantly tell me she is not in shape enough to go to the gym. I don't understand that sentence, okay? But it happens. It's the same way in church. People go, well, I don't. I want to connect with God. I want to go to church, but and, you know, I got to. I got to get good before I go there. Uh -huh. No. Right. Let me tell you what you come in like. I once went and visited a lady when I was living in Cincinnati, and I went in and walked through her yard and did not realize that I had stepped in a giant pile of dog poop. And I walked into her house and had to use the restroom. I don't know if it was some sort of. I smelt it, had to do it. I had no idea what was going on, but I had to go to the bathroom. So I had no idea. I had poop on my shoe. I walked through her house, very light, tan-colored carpet, and walked in through, went to the restroom. And on my way out, I look at the floor, and I'm realizing what has gone on. And I don't know the etiquette at the time. I thought, do I just quit ministry and leave? Like, I don't know what's supposed to go on right here. Um, what am I supposed to do? And my next move was like, well, maybe, maybe I, I get her. And we're like, well, let's clean up all the... Poop on the floor. Like, I have no idea. It was just a weird thing. And a lot of us tend to think that that's how we come into church. We come in and we go, well, I've got too much stink on me. I can't go in there. i got to get cleaned up first. And I just want to encourage you that God says, come on in. Track in everything you got with you. Let me get you clean once you get here. That's his job. And so if you're sitting there going, no, you don't understand the kind of stink on me. I just want you to know the person next to you reeks. They smell too. They are, uh, thank you. Hey, don't, Jason's nice. Be nice to him. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm just telling you. Well, as a matter of fact, everybody in here, nobody gets out clean. And we need to understand. Like, we even have groups of people, connect groups, that get together. These are just groups of stinky people who talk about how much they stink. They're afraid. We're not a church of perfect people. We're a, per, a, a church of, of people who have wrecked it, who have messed it up, who stink. And we come together and we're united under one thing, and that is the grace of Jesus Christ. We have been saved by grace through faith. It's not of anything that we've done, but because of Him and Him alone that we are where we are. And our job, our response to that is that we want to rescue as many more people as we possibly can. That's the focus that Satan wants to steal. If he can get us directed on anything other than rescuing lost people, he won. And so we want to stay focused. Now, the second thing, oh, I'm sorry, this is in your notes, you're going to write this down, is, and I love this, just this thought, that we can win the world when we're aligned behind the gospel. When we get that as a focus, man, we can do some incredible things. Second thing I want you to write down, Satan wants control. 
The reason he's going to attack our mind, the reason we need that helmet, is because he wants to get into our head and control us. In 2 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it says, Devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self Control. See, he wants to get in your head and he wants to lead you to where he wants you to go. And he's constantly lying to you to get you there. This has been his game from the beginning. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, they experienced nothing but great. Nothing but good. Nothing but God. Everything was wonderful. Satan comes in and he gives them the idea that they're somehow missing out on something better. He says, hey, there's this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You should eat from that. And they buy it. They buy the lie. And they go over and they eat from the tree. What they didn't realize was that all he's really offering is evil because all they've ever known is the good. All he did was introduce evil into the world. They already had perfection. But they bought the lie. And we do it all the time. We take things that are good things, but we make them the utmost thing and it becomes a problem for us. It, it looks like this. So we have things like this that come up in our life. Uh, working out. Nothing wrong with working out. Working out's a great thing. It, it makes you feel good. It might, might get some attention that, that can be good. It can be healthy. It can extend your life. It can help you have self-esteem. But if I press too far into it, it becomes this. It becomes vanity. It's where I get my identity. And it's a bad place to get an identity because it all eventually fades. If you put your identity in looks, looks always fade. And it becomes idolatry. I look at it as my source of, of healing and comfort. I become judgmental of other people. I, it builds an ego in me. I have the illusion that everybody's attracted to me. And I get tempted to do things that I wouldn't have done otherwise. Or maybe that's not yours, but maybe yours can be something like this. And we would all agree that pornography is bad, but so many people are into it because they go, oh, it's not hurting anybody or it's instant gratification. There's no baggage. I'm not involving anybody else. It's a stress relief. I deserve it. But what they don't realize when he gets them with this is it turns into lust and adultery, which is addictive. It destroys relationships and marriages. It's abusive. It kills people's sex drive. They can't even have intimacy with a spouse because their mind is in a fantasy world and it creates isolation. Or maybe for others, it's, it's just, man, chilling. I love it. I don't know about you, but I love chilling. Okay? Chilling is a great thing. If you're done, if it's done right, it's relaxing. It's easy. I mean, I love it. It's, it's super easy. Oh, you know what you have to do to chill? Nothing. It's mindless. It's comfortable. But if I lean into it too much, it gives way to laziness, which makes me selfish. It's all about, man, I just want my time, me time. I want it all about me. It kills my motivation. It makes me passive. It starts to, it starts to decrease potential in my life. There's things that I could be doing, should be doing, God wants me doing, and I'm not doing, which ultimately leads to me feeling worthless. Or maybe you take something that, listen, fast food, Chick-fil-A is of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will promise you that. But listen, when you eat too much of that, it's, but it's, it's good in moderation. It's easy. It's comfortable. It's, it meets kind of emotional need. And let's be honest, our culture, our schedules are so busy. Sometimes you just need it now, right? Like fast is good. But if I engage too much, and in church we don't talk about this word very much, but it leads to gluttony. It wrecks my health. It doesn't satisfy. It limits my ministry. It starts to kill relationships. And none of us would sign up for any of these things if Satan led with page two. But we do when he leads with page one. And we just let it go too far. We have to be careful. Don't believe the lie. Don't give up control. And some people go, well, those are just uh, mistakes, Jason. Those are just uh, mistakes that I make. Let me tell you something. A mistake is something that happens occasionally. When something happens over and over and over and over again, it's no longer a mistake. It's a choice. It's a choice that you're making to give control of your life over to something else. And we need to acknowledge that so that we can do battle with it. Number three, Satan wants to consume our emotional energy. This one gets me a lot. Psalm 42 says, why are you downcast, O oh, my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Most of our unhappiness, most of our struggle, most of our anxiety in our life is due to the fact that we're, we're talking to ourselves, and or excuse me, we're listening to ourselves and we're listening to Satan instead of talking to ourselves and talking to Satan. And what I mean by that is you ever wake up in the morning and, and you didn't ask for it at all, but all of a sudden uh, the day's bad. You just woke up to it. It just happened. You're under attack from the very beginning. You woke up and I can't do this. God won't do this. No one cares. It doesn't matter if. It's too late to. Like those things just hit you. Your past, your present, even the future you can imagine is under attack. And all you did was wake up. 
And too often what we're doing is we're listening to those lies that we feed ourselves. We're listening to those lies that Satan has fed us. What we need to do is stop listening and start speaking. We need to respond with truth. So when you or Satan reminds you of your past, you need to remind him of his future. You need to remind him of who God is. You need to remind him of who God is in you. You need to remind him of who the, what the promises of God say about you. We have to combat that in order to win. I get depression and anxiety. I understand it. I struggle with it. I, I'm, I'm there with you. Like, because, and here's the deal. Depression lies to you about everything. It's a struggle that we go through. Um, I, I was... <laughs> I was driving to work the other day. I had no reason for this. Just driving to work. I was just driving on George Bush. And all of a sudden, I mean, I was just in a down mood. I don't, any of y'all ever, no, I don't want to ask you. I'll just, if it's you, you know who it is. You just spiral, you get down, and you're kind of there. I was just there. And all of a sudden, I had this thought pop in my head. It went, Jason, you ain't got to be sad today. Like nobody, nobody woke up and said, Jason, yep, you're defeated today. You got to live that way. Like nobody said that. And I was thinking, I had been preparing this message for a long time, and so I was like, you know, I started, the first verse that came to my head was, uh, this is the day the Lord has made, I will be rejoicing and be glad in it. And I went back to like old school church when I was a little kid, like, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I mean, I was, I was getting after it, man. I was just like, man, I was, I was done. And all of a sudden, by the time I got to work, I was good. Like, I had, but I had to fight that stuff back. I had to talk to the voice in my head with Scripture, by the power of God. So listen, if you struggle with these emotional things, let me tell you some don'ts, some things you don't need to do. Um, you don't need to vent and attack. Now let me clarify that. We sometimes need to vent and get good counsel and wisdom from other people. But some of us have this belief that if I'm mad at Alex, and, and, and it's kind of like opening the, the valve on a teapot, if I'll just vent a little bit on him, then it'll help me calm down. And a lot of us believe that lie. And actually even psychology and scripture will tell you that's not true. That actually what doing that is, is like tightening the valve and turning up the heat. That all you're doing is getting angrier as you vent an attack on somebody. I'll tell you another one, and I'm not trying to make a statement about whether or not you should or shouldn't drink. That's a whole other message. But if you tend to be one that is under emotional attack, drinking alcohol is a bad idea for you. Because it is a depressant. That's what it is. What it constantly does is it presses you down into a depressed state. As a matter of fact, when you drink in excess, what it does is it, it's a, it's, it creates focus, actually, in your life, which sounds weird, but the focus only goes to the negative. What happens when you drink as a depressive, as a depressant, it focuses you on the problem, and you can no longer see anything else, including the solution. That's why you ever try to deal with somebody that's an alcoholic, they're, all they can talk about is the same problem over and over and over and over and over. That is a chemical result of alcohol. And that's why you don't need to do it. Another thing is don't isolate yourself. Don't get alone. That is, that to Satan, that is no different. Satan is like a roaring lion. That's like watching a gazelle wander off by itself. That is food, is all that is. And so we got to not isolate. Here's some things you can do. Focus on the good God is doing. Um, I, 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 I was challenged to do this one time because I was struggling uh, just to just say, just Jason, write down something God's doing good in your life, something God's using you to do, and just put it in your pocket. Um, and matter of fact, I get reminders all the time. I had somebody give me, this is a coin, on long story, but it has to do with the Armor of God series, and they gave it to me a few weeks ago, and so I've been carrying it around in my pocket just as a little reminder of what God's doing, how God's communicating, and sometimes just reminding yourself of that good is a good thing. Also, exercise or, or relax, depending on which end of the spectrum you need to go to. Um, connect with somebody else. When you tend to get emotionally drained, when Satan is winning and, steal, and, and, and infecting your emotional energy, go get in community. Get some structure and some goals. Your goals may be simple, like I'm going to spend five minutes in prayer in the morning and ten minutes reading my Bible at night. Some structure. Or maybe just a personal goal or whatever. But at the same time, go, don't be afraid to get counseling. There's no stigma to counseling. Counseling is the act of a person who has wisdom recognizing they've reached a limit and going to seek wisdom for it. That's all counseling is. And so don't be afraid to do it. And so here's the deal. Satan is going to press into you about lies in your mind. And here's the cool thing. Let me just kind of combat that with some God truth for you today. Um, God does not just see who you are. God sees who you're going to become. Amen. And man, that is good news. And God doesn't just see what you're doing right now. God sees what you will do. And God is excited about what can happen in your life. 
And so that's the helmet of salvation. Now we're going to move on to the sword of the spirit. I got to get my little friend out here for a minute. Oh yeah. It just got real up in here. Yeah. Okay, listen. I'm going to tell you why I involved this in my message. Because it's really cool. I had this at home. I used to preach and talk about Braveheart all the time when I was uh, many years ago. And a buddy of mine went, I'm going to get you a sword. And I saw this in my closet that day. And I was like, well, I've got to find a way to work that into my sermon on Sunday. So it's here because it looks stinking awesome. And so that's what God is calling us to do is to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, let me tell you what is so great about this. It is, listen, there, everything you've put on so far in the armor of God is defensive. Amen. Until this moment. That's right. It is the one offensive weapon that you have. And Satan does not want you to acknowledge it. Because Satan does. Listen, if you're taking notes, write this down. Satan wants to distract us from the power that we have. Yeah. Um, I played high school football. We once played against a team called Odessa Permium. If you are familiar with that <laughs> team. Let me tell you how this goes. If you're in 1992 and you're a team that played them. We went to their stadium. Out in Odessa, Texas. Is in the middle of nowhere at the time. I don't know about now. Um, at one point, early uh, before the game started, they turn off all the lights in the stadium, and their kind of theme thing is Mojo Magic. And what happens is all of the entire stadium starts to go Mojo, 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 and we're like, oh, they're gonna kill us in this cornfield. <laughs> like, 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 it's terrifying. And when the lights come back on, the entire team is standing about 10 yards in front of you in black uniforms with white letters, and they are huge. And we're like, well, we lost. I quit. I'm out of here. Like, like, we, like, like we lost before we ever played a down. Because they had a strategy, a scheme, to keep us from succeeding right from the beginning. And that's what Satan does. He wants to scheme every way he can to get you to never pull that sword. He'll tell you the Bible's boring. He'll tell you it's out of date. He'll tell you it doesn't have any power. Whatever he has to do. And it's because he wants you to try to fight with the wrong tools. Because you can't win this battle with your intellect. You can't win it with willpower. You can't win it with money. You can't win it with your, your athletic ability. It is a spiritual battle. It requires a spiritual weapon. And we have an enemy, the devil, who has an army and is morally insane. He wants to destroy you, and he schemes to keep your sword in its sheath. Why? Because he knows the moment you pull it, he's done. He's terrified of it. And so he's created everything he can around the Word of God, including things like boredom, to keep us from pulling that weapon out ever. And so... I want you to hear a little bit from Jesus himself, how Jesus pulls the sword to use scripture. When Satan comes at him and says, uh, you're not this, you're not that, he takes him in the wilderness right when Jesus starts his earthly ministry. And he unsheathes that sword and starts quoting back scripture to Satan right. and Satan can't help but back down. Amen. He goes into, I love this scene, shortly after that he wanders down into town this, and he walks into a temple. And he goes in there, this is not a place he normally preached. Um, and so he walks into the temple and he grabs the scroll and he begins to read it. He reads words they've been reading for almost a thousand years. The words that he read are out of the book of Isaiah, they go like this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Now they've heard these a million times, but they've never identified who the me is in this. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Like he reads the, the, the scripture about a revolution is about to start. <laughs> And then he says this, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. He goes, you want to know who the rescuer is? He just showed up. He is declaring that. And from that moment, he pulls that sword and he walks into the world and he does damage to every, when there is an orphan, he brings, he becomes a father to the fatherless. When there is hurting, he becomes the great physician. He brings healing. He brings hope to the hopeless. He brings help to the helpless. To the lost, he brings salvation. 
In other words, when you go, no, I'm too old, God can't use me. Well, that's interesting because the Bible says that they will still yield fruit in old age. Well, no, I'm too young. Well, the Bible says that no one looked down on you because you're young. Oh, okay. I'm too ugly. No, you're God's masterpiece. I have no purpose. Um, that's not true. The Bible says that, that you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. So he, he planned you to have a purpose before you planned to be here. And then what about this? I can't do it. Yeah, you can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so we're going to take the truth of God and we're going to press back against the lies. And that's why people will say, should I listen to podcasts? Sure. Should I do daily devotionals? Absolutely. What, what about, um, Jason, should, should, I, should I study in alone? Yeah, that's cool. Should I study in groups? You betcha. Whatever you can do to get the word of God in, because that's what you want to do. The belt of truth we talked about in week one is all about bringing the word of God into me. The sword of the spirit is all about bringing the word of God out of me and using it in this world. Listen, if you've done nothing but bring the word of God into you and you've never taken it out of you, you are having, listen, that's like breathing in and holding it. You'll die. You have to exhale. You need to bo go both ways. And so some of us need to get active with the sword. It's super, super important. He doesn't want you to do it. Get the voice of God close to you so that when Satan comes against you with his lies, you'll be able to keep those things on the outside. And that leads me to the final thing Satan wants to do is that Satan wants to rob us of abundant life. Satan knows that the moment we pull that sword, we start to live in the purpose that God has for us. The moment we pull that sword, that he knows that there are people that are, listen, just like, just like the, that reference of Jesus said, it says that he, we're going to preach good news to the poor. We're, we're going to release the captives. We're going to give sight to the blind. He knows that the moment we pull that sword, freedom starts to come from people. Uh, people that are oppressed start to get liberated. Like He knows that the rescue begins the moment that that sword is pulled out of its sheath. And he doesn't want that. The most abundant life we can live is as a warrior for God in this world. On the cross, Jesus Christ was saying all kinds of things about his love and about his mercy and about his grace for us. But let me tell you another one. As he was there with his hands and his feet nailed to that tree, he was also shouting out across history to everyone who would call him Lord. I believe in you. I know the plans I have for you. I have an intention to use you to do things you could not have imagined doing without me. And that's his good news for us. And it's awesome to think about. Because God created you with the heart of a warrior. You go, oh, I don't know about that. I'll prove it to you. I'm a huge movie buff. You might say movie nerd. Whatever. <laughs> but I want to share this with you. I've got some music I want to play. Just let to see if it inspires something in you. Just get a feeling of my battling intergalactic bones. I want to get a lightsaber and just go. What about this one right here? Check this out. How many of you just want to get in an airplane and go on with Maverick and Goose and get after it? What about this? Pirates of the Caribbean, man. Just get up there with, with, with Captain Jack Sparrow and do some damage. Or listen. Even those poor people that were picking on that girl with frozen issues. I mean, like, she was just doing battle with all of those people. I mean, it was crazy. And then there was those poor people that got on a boat that needed to get on that door at the end. Because poor Leonardo DiCaprio was about to get consumed by the water. Or how about people that just want to dance? They just want to dance, man. They just want to get out there and dance as much as they can in that city. Or, and this is it, my favorite. <laughs> If you've ever wondered why that is, can I just tell you this? I didn't do that just to be funny. Let me tell you why this is so cool. Every, everything that gives you that moment of inspiration, everything that gives you that buildup inside you, that is a constant. Remember. Listen, that didn't just happen because somebody put together a great musical score. That happened because that heart of a warrior was already there to begin with. And it's just these little moments that are reminders that you were built for this battle. So you may be going, well, Jason, I'm in the middle of a battle, but I'll be honest with you, it's terrifying right now. 
I got this battle going on over here. I got this person in my family that's lost and trying to reach them for Christ. I got this person in my workplace that just desperately needs to be encouraged. They're, man, they're going through a struggle. I, I, I got this person over here that is just irritating the mess out of me and I'm trying to learn how to forgive them. And, and I feel like man, my head is on a swivel and I'm just trying to keep up. Can I just, I'm going to encourage you that that might be the best place for you. A movie that came out several years ago that I'm a big fan of is called Saving Private Ryan. Depicts World War II, D-Day. One of the most horrific battle scenes that was ever put on film. It won many awards. Very, very gruesome. If you don't know anything about it, let me explain it to you. There was uh, the largest amphibious to land assault in the history of warfare. They started a bombardment with bombs early that morning at around 5 a.m. Seven battleships, 18 cruisers, 43 destroyers. And they hit that beach over and over again from 5 a.m. to 6.25 a.m. At 6.31 a.m., U.S. troops hit the shore. They have estimated that in the Battle of Omaha Beach alone, 360 million rounds of ammunition were fired. As a matter of fact, they say that if you go to that beach today, 4-5% to of all the sand on that beach is still made up of metal particles from that battle. Thousands of people died. If you watch the movie, it, it shows something really powerful, and it's the illustration I want you to get as we conclude today. You'll see two kinds of soldiers on the beach. There are these guys that look calm, <coughs> controlled, peaceful, not rattled. And then there's these other soldiers that look panicked, Nervous and chaotic. And I'll tell you the difference between the two. Those guys are dead already. See, if you're in the middle of a battle and you're active in it, your head's on a swivel. You're paying attention. There's bombs going off. It's how you're reminded that you are alive in the war. Praise the Lord. And we want to be alive in that war. Yes. And so if you go, man, right now my life has is, is got a lot of chaos going on, I would say that might be a great indication that you're at least in the middle of a place where you're fighting from. Yes. And maybe it's just time for you to fight a little better, yes. fight a little stronger, yes. take up the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, yes. and go to war. Praise the Lord. See, abundant life isn't always easy. It means that you have to fight. And you don't just fight. You fight for the things that you need to fight for. And you need a cause. And every warrior is only as good as the cause that he fights for. Yes. And until you tap into that, a lot of us become destructive or bored. Yes. And there's a time for peace, but I need us to hear this today. And I know this isn't the most comforting thought to wrap our message up in. But there is also a time to draw a line in the sand and fight for what we believe in. Yes. And as believers, we need to begin doing that. A passive warrior hesitates. A passive warrior gets wounded or they get somebody else wounded. Our greatest fear is failure, but our greatest pain at the end of our life is regret about not engaging in the battle that was in front of us. And so I just want to ask you, are you going to regret anything for the rest of your life? Is there something you could do today that would help you avoid regretting not doing it for the rest of your life? To pick up your sword. To go to that person who is lost and without Christ and to open the word of God and say, no, no, no. Here's what the Bible says for you. To go to that person that's hurting and to open the word of God and to give them encouragement. To go to yourself and to read Psalm 139. To be reminded that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And God has designed me for a purpose. To take the sword out of its sheath and to use it every single day of your life. When you do, we begin to win the battles.